So our next speaker is uh, Adam Webb, who helps run the neurocritical care service, uh, the neuroscience service at Grady. He's also one of the medical directors, um, has been involved in neurocritical care for quite some time. He's going to talk about target, targeted temperature management as one of the strategies that we've used for quite a few years, but for which there continues to be evolving evidence. Thank you, Adam. Not a problem. Thanks. Um, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, when I've uh, talked about this topic in the past here, um, it seemed much more certain uh, than it does right now. And so um, <clears throat> just a, a couple of disclosures to get out of the way uh, beforehand um, that I have received compensation from Bard Medical previously as a speaker, and they're a manufacturer of targeted temperature or temperature modulation devices, um, though I won't talk much about devices today. So the objectives that I'm going to try to go through in just a short time here, um, the first is to just briefly review the um, outcomes from the 2002 sort of landmark trials for targeted temperature management or therapeutic hypothermia um, with a, the both uh, targeted goal of 33 degrees centigrade, actually 32 to 34. Um, and then I'm going to review the 2013 um, targeted temp temperature management trial that, that compared two different target temperatures, one at 33 degrees centigrade and the other at 36 degrees centigrade. Um, and then from that springboard into the controversy that's developed um, really over the past year about what really should we be doing with these patients, because I think that there's a lot of uncertainty now. So one thing we are definitely certain of is that fever is bad in patients with brain injury. We know that. We know that in almost every type of brain injury. Um, specifically in cardiac arrest patients, if you look at some data that's looked at this, patients with a temperature greater than 39 degrees centigrade um, during the first 72 hours uh, from cardiac arrest are 38 times more likely to experience brain death. Um, and the odds of an unfavorable outcome increased by two times for every degree above 37 in the first 48 hours following cardiac arrest. We see this routinely um, with any type of brain injury. Stroke and fever is bad. Subarachnoid hemorrhage and fever is bad. Traumatic brain injury and fever is bad. All of those things. However, one, one piece of that, that's not, that that we've really not been able to, to link is, can we modulate that, that adverse outcome by, tar by treating the fever and bringing it down to normothermia? Um, that's sort of been a holy grail in a lot of different brain injury trials of, of various etiologies, and we just haven't gotten there yet. Um, so this is one thing that we do know. In 2002, in the same issue, there were two trials that were published um, that were they're referred to now as the Bernard trial and the Haka trial. Um, this is the Haka trial that was uh, the largest of the two trials. Um, and this had 273 patients. Um, it looked at patients with VFib and VTAC arrest. And, it's, uh, and those that were treated with 24 hours of hypothermia or targeted temperature management to a goal of 32 to 34 degrees centigrade had a better chance of a favorable neurologic outcome as well as a reduced mortality. Um, so if you look up here, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up a, a table with these uh, a little bit better to discern. So the favorable neurologic outcome in this, um, in the normothermia group, um, was 39%. Um, and death in the normothermia group, thermia group was 55%. Um, it was essentially the reverse of that in the hypothermia group, with over 50%, 55% having a good neurologic outcome. Um, so this was fantastic evidence. This was published along with this Bernard trial um, that had 77 patients that were cooled. Um, these cooled very quickly. There were, the cooling was initiated in route to the hospital um, to a goal of 33 degrees centigrade for 12 hours. Um, the odds ratio for a good outcome for, with these two trials was anywhere between four, uh, or I'm sorry, was 5.25. The number needed to treat was between anywhere between four and six um, patients with targeted temperature management in order to give one person a better or a good neurologic outcome. This trial had a trend towards mortality benefit, but it wasn't statistically significant. It's a relatively small trial also. Um, these are just a graphical representation of these two trials, along with one other uh, randomized control trial. Um, <clears throat> and these were all of the non-randomized trials that were published, uh, or not, not all prior to this, but over the course of about uh, five decades around this time. Obviously, non-randomized trials, um, there are significant biases that can be introduced there. But, um, but basically showing that Generally speaking, the publication of trials regarding, uh, regarding tar targeted temperature management in these circumstances, there didn't seem to be a lot of discrepancy. That's in randomized and non-randomized trials, um, that's the patients that were cooled after cardiac arrest seemed to do better. This led to a number of different um, organizations, the American Heart Association, uh, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, along with some other partners, um, 
as well as the, uh, the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, the first to, to put out guidelines on this, to fairly strongly recommend targeted temperature management to a goal temperature of 32 to 34 uh, degrees centigrade um, for all patients with VFib and VTAC arrest. Um, and then weaker recommendations, or at least consideration of targeted temperature management to the same goal for patients that had PDA or asystole. Um, and so from about 2002 up till this point, many of you have been involved in um, all sorts of, uh, of, of efforts to try to make this happen. This isn't something that, that is necessarily, or was at that time, an easy thing to do. Um, that units and teams weren't necessarily set up to do this. And so there's been a lot of efforts to try to really standardize care for these patients and, and really try to achieve goal temperature, maintain goal temperature, do slow rewarming, um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's taken a long time to adopt and to, uh, to execute. And now, recently, a lot of that has come into question as to, as to whether or not the benefits are what we think they are um, and wh whether or not we can get those same benefits in different ways. So um, Nielsen, who's the, the first author on the, uh, another tr or trial I'm about to talk about, um, published a sort of a meta-analysis and, uh, and a trial protocol in the American Heart uh, Journal in 2012. Basically, his argument was, and his, and his colleagues, was that overall the quality of evidence, despite the, you know, the uptake over 10 years um, and, uh, and this, you know, what I would say is dramatic evidence in terms of the, the differences in outcome, said basically, though, that overall the quality of the evidence from those, those, those trials and other trials was, was still relatively low in comparison to other things that we do. Um, and that he pointed out that the, the groups in these, in, in these trials were essentially randomized to a very protocolized therapy that included targeted temperature management versus just what was considered usual care at the time, usual, usual ICU care. Um, and, and that's essentially what they were saying is that the beneficial effects may have simply been from prevention of fever or any other part of those protocols or a combination of parts of those protocols, um, and that, it, and that um, it may not be from targeted temperature management entirely or targeted temperature management itself. Um, also pointed out that there were various modes of treatment in the HACA trial and the Bernard trial, um, and uh, so they proposed a trial, a large trial, um, and they designed it as a superiority trial um, to look for an 11% difference in absolute mortality um, between groups. Um, and, and they were looking at two different groups. Oops, before I get to that. Um, so one of the things that they, that they showed, or they looked at in the HACA trial, and this, was, this graph was in the HACA trial, um, was that the normothermia group wasn't entirely normothermic. In fact, some portion of them <coughs> had very elevated temperatures. Um, and, and essentially the argument from this was, could it have been just the fever in those groups that, that, that influenced the outcome? So at the end of 2013, December of 2013, um, this, ar this article was published in um, the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen this trial, and it's created a lot of debate. So this was targeted temperature management at 33 degrees centigrade, or what would have been the standard of care based on the guideline recommendations and the, the, uh, um, the, the evidence from previous trials versus targeted temperature management at 36 degrees. So not normothermia versus targeted temperature management. This was essentially two different targeted temperature management arms, just with different goals. So it's a, it was a randomized controlled trial. They um, performed this trial at 36 ICUs in Europe and Australia. Um, their inclusion criteria were out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, a presumed cardiac etiology. Um, it didn't matter what the presenting rhythm was. Um, that it could be VFib, VTAC, VEA, or asystole. Patients had to be greater than 18, they had to be comatose, um, and they had to have greater than 20 minutes of spontaneous circulation after resuscitation. They were excluded, and this should, this shouldn't, this should say if the interval between um, return in, of spontaneous circulation and randomization was greater than 240 minutes. Um, and so they allowed four hours for randomization um, in this trial. Um, unwitnessed uh, cardiac arrest with initial asystole, um, or suspected or known neurologic etiology, or spontaneous body temperature less than 30 degrees centigrade. There were a number of other uh, sort of minor inclusion exclusion criteria, but these were the main ones. Um, and so they randomized patients to a targeted temperature management with this target temperature of either 33 degrees centigrade or 36 degrees centigrade for 36 hours. Um, and that included the time of cooling, that included the time they were at goal temperature, and that included the time to rewarming. They allowed centers to do essentially whatever their local standard was in terms of 
uh, of methodology of cooling. So tar they, they could use ice packs, they could use cold saline, they could use advanced cooling devices like intravascular therapy. Um, essentially, whatever they did um, it was, it was at the discretion of the site. Um, after 28 hours, gradual rewarming was allowed to 37 degrees centigrade at a rate of 0 0.5 uh, degrees per hour. Um, and then body temperature was maintained or attempted to be maintained below 37.5 um, out to 72 hours post arrest. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they attempted to, one of the, I think, a fascinating part of this trial um, that's, that's worth reading on, on its own, is, which is in the appendix of this trial, um, is that they, they adopted a standardized protocol for neurologic prognostication and recommendations for continuation versus termination of life support. Um, this, this type of protocol could probably never be executed in the, in the United States just based on um, how we view decisions about this. But um, it really was a, a, a unique attempt at trying to take out this idea of, um, of the self-fulfilling prophecy of, you know, mortality in the, in the setting of, of poor neurologic uh, prognosis. And so someone who was blinded to um, which arm the patient was in came at, after the 72-hour period, um, they looked at a number of things, clinical examinations, somatosensory evoked potentials, EEG, with, uh, was the patient having seizures? Um, I don't think imaging was part of it. And they made a recommendation. They said either this patient's going to have a poor prognosis and you should terminate life support, or we don't know what the patient's prognosis is, you should continue with therapy. Um, and, and most of the time, um, the, the ultimate decision was up to the treating team, but, but much of the time they followed recommendations for this. And so um, this is unusual in clinical trials, but is a way to, um, to really try to standardize this and take it, take it out of the mix a little bit. Um, the primary outcome that they looked at was all-cause mortality through 180 days, and they had secondary outcomes, essentially, of, of uh, poor neurologic function of, or death, and they defined this by modified Rankin um, and cerebral performance categories. So here are their outcomes. Um, I would pay attention more to the one at the bottom. Now, the one side is interesting, um, but the one at the bottom uh, essentially looks at the primary outcome, with, which was death at the end of the trial, which was essentially the same in both groups. Um, that, uh, there, that it was you know, very close in both groups. And the secondary outcome, neurologic function at follow-up um, or death at, at uh, 180 days, also identical across the board. So <clears throat> they concluded from this that in unconscious survivors of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with presumed cardiac cause, that includes VFib, VTAC, PEA, asystole, um, that targeted temperature management at a target of 33 degrees centigrade um, was, no, was of no benefit compared to that at 36. Um, and so this really shook the foundation of a lot of things that we do for targeted temperature management. I don't think anyone really questioned, well, some people questioned it, but, but many of us didn't really question were we at the appropriate target temperature. That was just the target temperature that had been used in the trials, um, and, and so therefore that was what we were tackling. So the question comes up is, what, what is the takeaway from this trial? Because there's been lots of takeaways that people have had, depending on how you know, closely they, they've looked at this. You've had some people that have said, you know, this is the end of therapeutic hypothermia for cardiac arrest patients. Um, you've had others that have said, even with this trial, we're not going to change our practice. We still think that um, we're doing it the right way. We've set up all these systems to do it the right way. Um, but it, it really brings up some interesting questions. So, this is a comparison table that essentially looks at death and favorable neurologic outcome um, in all three of these trials. So you have the HACA trial on top, the Bernard trial, which was the smaller one in the middle, and the targeted temperature management um, one, which is at the bottom. Remembering that the Bernard and HACA trial were, were executed in 2002, um, and the TTM trial has really been in the last couple of years, I think 2012 to 2000, and it's like 2011, 2012, somewhere in there it started. So there's a couple of things I want to point out from this, because I think these are important as we're interpreting this trial and the sort of collective of all of, all of the evidence. Um, the first interesting thing is that even in the hypothermia group, or the target of 33 uh, uh, group, um, that in the target temperature management trial, which was 10 years later, um, the, the mortality rate in this trial was, was, we can't make a direct comparison, but was higher. Um, and was higher but by at least a clinically relevant amount. Um, and so the, 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 the rate of, or the percentage of death in, in the, the 33 degree target was 50% in the target temperature management trial um, and closer to 40% uh, in the HACA trial. It was closer to 50 in the Bernard trial. Um, and that also patients um, didn't do as well 
um, in terms of favorable neurologic outcomes in the targeted temperature management trial um, in the 33 group as they did in, in the, the 33 groups in the previous trials, that their, their percentage of favorable neurologic outcome wasn't quite as good. And in the normothermia group, or in the, so if you compare the normothermia group to the target of 36 group, one thing you see is that death was far less common in those patients. And so um, that, that if you look at it as a sort of historical control, that patients were doing better um, in the target, of the target of 36 in the recent trial, um, and that far more of those patients had a favorable neurologic outcome than in the normothermia group in previous trials. And so this just brings up the question of, uh, of essentially, you know, where are we really comparing things accurately? And there's a couple of different reasons this may be the case. Um, and a lot of these, those have been pointed out in the controversy. So I want to get to a little bit of the criticism and debate that's been generated around this. And I'll sort of divide this up into a couple of different groups of, of criticism and debate. Um, the first is what I would sort of call the epidemiologist or the, the evidence-based medicine, medicine criticism, which is essentially is that that's, you have to be careful with how you interpret the results of this trial because of how it was set up. That this was set up as a superiority trial and not as a, um, as, as a non-inferiority trial. And so this trial, what it was set up to do, empowered to do, um, was to show is there an 11% absolute risk reduction for mortality if you cool to 33 versus 36. And it failed to do that. And so sort of the purist would say, well, it failed to show that there was that much of a difference um, but does a negative superiority trial really, um, or can you interpret that as no difference exists between the two? And I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anyone do, does is, in terms of uh, is there a difference, but saying that this trial doesn't settle it. This trial doesn't, um, doesn't tell us for sure. Then there's other, other criticism and debate, um, and one of which I, I pointed to, which is that the outcomes in this study were worse than the previously published outcomes in 2002. With all the knowledge that we've gained in terms of resuscitation of these patients over 10 years, you would have expected that we would have seen better outcomes um, in, in either both groups or um, certainly in the, in the, the target of 33 group, um, and that wasn't the case. And then there's sort of the, the, what I would call the slightly nitpicky arguments about this, but I think are relevant, and I think that we at least have to look at them, um, because it tells us a little bit about you know, some of the reason we're seeing differing results from this. And so um, Keyes Polderman has been one that has, has really tried to pick this apart a little bit, um, and has talked about a couple of different things. One of which was that the, if you compare this to how other trials, sort of enrollment in other trials, is that the enrollment per patient screen was unusually high in this trial. And so that for every patient screen, I think like almost 75% 70, of the patients that were screened were enrolled in this trial, is between 60 and 75, um, which is high, um, which is high for almost any trial. Um, and so one of the things that, that, that it was hypothesized with that is that, that there, there may have been some selection bias in this trial, uh, that, that patients who were likely to benefit may not have been even you know, screened for this trial or allowed to be screened for this trial. Um, and so that was one criticism of this. Um, another thing was that there, the average enrollment per center was pretty low. So it wasn't like there were a lot of centers that were doing a lot of this work, um, that the average enrollment was one patient per center per month, um, which they regarded as low. Um, some of the technical details about the cooling that have been brought up is that this was a relatively rapid rate for rewarming, um, which as we've seen, especially in the, um, in the TBI literature, that these details matter in terms of rate, re rate of rewarming, in terms of the duration of cooling, all of these things. Um, and also just in terms of can we apply this to the population that we're looking at, that this, um, in, in these countries where this was, this was performed, there's an unusually high rate of bystander CPR, um, 74%. Um, but it's also interesting if you look at that, um, that, that, that patients didn't do as well as, as you would expect um, given previous outcomes. So uh, one other thing is that uh, there, was a, there was a very long um, uh, return of spontaneous circulation in some of these patients. Um, so they'd been down a long time. It was a sick group. Um, and there were a lot of, even though the, the specific differences uh, were, were not statistically significant between the groups, that if you looked at them cumul cumul cumulatively, um, that, that you could make an argument that the group that got 33, that had a target of 33, um, were much sicker. They had higher rates of, of if you looked at all of the different uh, features of the two groups, um, that the sort of negative features were present or were more more often present in the 33 degree uh, uh, 33 degree group. 
So other things, just in terms of how we compare this, is that this trial included patients with un unwitnessed arrest as well as patients with an initial rhythm of asystole and PEA. Um, and these patients often have a much poorer uh, outcome. And so could this have, have sort of diluted the outcome benefit of the other group? Um, even though there was a subgroup analysis that was done that didn't show that. Um, the other is that the time to target temperature was extremely long comparatively um, in these trials. So they not only allowed four hours from return of spontaneous circulation <coughs> to the point at which patients were randomized, um, that, that they added on to that another eight hours from, from the time they're randomized to the time that um, they achieved target temperature. So many of these patients didn't achieve tar target temperature at a mean of about 12 hours. Um, and that's compared to six to eight hours in some of the earlier trials. So that may have an impact. So where does all that leave us? Um, and I, I, I would say that, that it leaves us with a lot of questions. Um, but I think that it's, it's compelling evidence for a couple of different things. Um, one of the things that we, I think we absolutely know from this trial is that regardless of the goal temperature, temperature management clearly influences outcome after cardiac arrest. Um, and so I think that, that this, in, in some ways, is a, at least a win for fever control, which we've been looking for in brain injury patients for a long time saying that, that we have to be concerned about fever and about temperature control after cardiac arrest, regardless of what our goal is. Um, I think it's a little bit early to abandon the goal of 33 degrees centigrade um, for patients with VFib and VTAC arrest. We still, in this trial, did not achieve the same outcomes that were achieved in the previous trials um, in terms of good outcomes. And so I think that though you can't necessarily directly compare those groups, um, we have to say, well, we, you know, that was 10 years ago and we still haven't been able to, or we, you know, this trial didn't achieve even as good as we were doing then. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see what the next round of guidelines, uh, uh, um, what they recommend with this, um, if, they, if the, the recommendations stay for this goal for, 30, or, or for VFib and VTAC arrest or if it changed. Um, and also likely with many of these that more, more research needs to be done. But if you look at epidemiolo epidemiologic data um, over the course of the you know, past decade or from 2000 to 2010, one thing is definitely for, for certain, which is that, that patients are doing better after cardiac arrest. Um, that the risk-adjusted rates of survival to discharge have increased from 13.7% in 2000 to 22.3% uh, in 2009. So more patients are living. Um, and that the rates of clinically significant neurologic disability among survivors decreased from 33% in 2000 to 28% in 2009. Um, that's probably the cumulative effects of a lot of different things, improved CPR, um, improvements in critical care, but target temperature management may have certainly played a role in that. And it's some, so it's something that we, we have to consider as we interpret all of this. Here's a, there's been lots of point counterpoints on this that are worth reading um, to get a little bit better idea of this, uh, this, this uh, debate. With that, I'll take questions. 